Welcome back, everyone. Very glad to see everybody here today. Uh, of course, it's President's Day weekend, so we have a fitting and appropriate uh, President's Day topic today. So I just I adjust my mic here. Uh, we'll be delving into Abraham Lincoln, our nation's 16th president. Now, our theme for our winter lecture series this year is turning points. And we're going to be looking at one of the major turning points in Lincoln's life and in his political career today. And we have quite a bit of ground to cover, so we're going to go ahead and dive right into it here. Typically, when we think of Abraham Lincoln here at Gettysburg, this is the face that we envision. This is the Lincoln that we reference. Lincoln's visit here, November 19th of 1863, really with the eyes of history on him, on the stage where he is the commander in chief, is attempting to lead the nation through this terrible civil war, taking the lives of hundreds of thousands of Americans, the nation really debating what it is going to be going forward, what freedom is in the United States going forward. This major struggle with Lincoln himself at the center of it, catapulting him to be perhaps our most famous and I would say definitely our greatest president. Well, it's interesting to think that five years before Lincoln stood here at Gettysburg, he was speaking about some of the same things that he spoke about here. Five years before Lincoln came to Gettysburg to deliver his famed Gettysburg Address, he was in the political fight of his life in Illinois. His face here doesn't yet have those famous whiskers yet. He's not yet aged by the stresses of war. This is a man who is fighting against a political giant, Stephen Douglas. He is in the fight of his life in more ways than one, and he and Douglas are engaged in a series of seven debates across the state of Illinois in the midst of a particularly bitter and partisan campaign for an Illinois Senate seat. These debates centered on the institution of slavery and freedom in the United States. And it's interesting that Illinois is not a slave state, and yet this is the stage for some of the most poignant debates over slavery and freedom in the United States that occurred. Last weekend, you heard my friend and colleague, John Hoptak, speak about the Compromise of 1850 and how that was such a major event, a pivotal turning point in the eventual road towards civil war that occurred. I would say the Lincoln-Douglas debates are a similar turning point in that they help to frame the issues that are eventually at stake here in this civil war. They frame this major argument as it would later emerge. But they're also a major turning point in that these debates catapult Abraham Lincoln from a state politician in Illinois to a national leader on these issues. The debates are published in newspapers across the country. They garner attention. Lincoln's name shoots upwards. And of course, two years later, he and Douglas end up squaring off again. But for now, let's examine the events of 1858, these famous debates between Lincoln and Douglas and some of the issues that they discussed. Uh, before the debates, Abraham Lincoln really hadn't had a ton of success in his professional career. We don't really need to do the whole background and bio on Abraham Lincoln. A man like him is, is so well known and so famous. So I just have a few events listed here. You'll notice that he does have some political successes. He was a member of the Illinois State Legislature for a while. He served one term in Congress, uh, being elected in 1846 famously opposing the Mexican War during his one congressional term. But this is a guy who suffered far more political defeats than he's had uh, political successes. And we will find, especially in the life of Lincoln, it's true with so many historical figures, that failure ultimately breeds success. And personally, as a fan of the Cleveland Indians, I have no choice but to believe that. <laughs> I always have to have one good joke in up front. <laughs> By the early 1850s, Lincoln's political ambitions had been tempered, possibly for good. He had returned to his legal practice after his time in Congress, and it really didn't look like he was going to reemerge as a figure in the national debate over freedom and slavery. But slavery was very important <laughs> for Lincoln during his political career and important for him personally. We can take his comments on slavery as being tepid or lukewarm today because he didn't boldly call for outright abolition 
during the 1850s. But the context of his time, as we're going to see as we go forward, is very important, especially the context of Illinois uh, in, 18, in the 1850s. But his position on slavery was the same as the nascent Republican Party. Stop the westward spread of slavery, return to the idea that the founding fathers had of restricting the spread of slavery, simply keeping it as a necessary evil that would hopefully die out. And that's one of the things that we're going to revisit from time to time, Lincoln's thoughts on this. Perhaps his most poignant quote on slavery is from a short fragment that he wrote right before these famous debates with Stephen Douglas in 1858 in August. As I would not be a slave, so I would not be a master. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is not democracy. Well, of course, for the United States in the 19th century, slavery was inextricably tied to the westward expansion of the country. Every single time new territories were acquired, every single time a new state was being considered, the question was, is this new territory or state going to be slave or free? The Missouri Compromise of 1820 had settled the issue for several decades, at least a tenuous compromise holding things together for several decades, establishing this line here, the 3630 line, as a demarcation point, essentially saying the territories north of this line, no slavery in those territories. Territories south of it are indeed open for slavery. Another trade-off was Missouri was added as a slave state, Maine added as a free state. And for over 30 years, this compromise held things together. Not always well. There are still tensions and violence and bloodshed, in many cases, over slavery as it expands. But it held, th it held things together until the principle of the Missouri Compromise was overrun by this idea of popular sovereignty. Popular sovereignty was introduced with the Kansas-Nebraska Act. It was codified into law with the Kansas-Nebraska Act, introduced essentially to help settle some of these territories quicker so that a transcontinental railroad could expand westward. This Kansas-Nebraska Act was a major political earthquake moment that realigned the tectonic plates of American politics, shattering the old party system and creating a new Republican Party which was basically an amalgamation of different political groups that were all opposed to the westward spread of slavery. So the Kansas-Nebraska Act, pictured here, overruns this idea of, pop, uh, of the Missouri Compromise and becomes the new ruling guide for the westward spread of slavery. And the Kansas-Nebraska Act was introduced onto the national scene by none other than Stephen Douglas. Stephen Douglas. Born in Vermont in 1813, his father was a physician who died when Douglas was not one year old. He was a cabinet-making apprentice as a teenager, moved to New York in 1830. He taught school and studied law, eventually moved to Cleveland, Ohio in 1833, and then westward on to Illinois. It's not necessarily the backstory you'd expect for someone who was eventually the, considered the inevitable nominee of a major political party for the presidency of the United States. In 1847, when Douglas married Martha Martin, he inherited through Martha a prominent slaveholding plantation in Mississippi, a 2,500-acre plantation with 100 slaves. And though Douglas himself never personally managed it, he had a property manager manage it for him, he himself was involved personally and politically, professionally with the institution of slavery. He rose in the Illinois Democratic Party in the 1830s, was a state attorney, an Illinois House representative, a registrar of the Springfield Land Office, the Illinois Secretary of State, and in 1841, an Associate Justice of the Illinois Supreme Court at the age of 27. He's a fast rising figure. And for those who might be curious, if you've ever read the text of the Lincoln-Douglas debates, Lincoln constantly refers to Douglas not as Senator Douglas, but Judge Douglas. That's because of his status on the Illinois Supreme Court. Douglas was elected to the U.S. House in 1843, elected to the United States Senate in 1846. And he's a major proponent of compromise in that compromise of 1850. When the initial omnibus compromise bill fails, Douglas helps to push these various compromise measures through on their own, inevitably achieving this compromise effect. Uh, not to dive too much into the details of last week's lecture, but Douglas is a big major figure on the national scene by the early 1850s, and Kansas, Nebraska helps to solidify his front status in the Democratic Party. 
And Lincoln and Douglas, they too have their own backstory as well, even though they're very different men in, in different ways. They had first met in the state legislature in 1834. And uh, Lincoln had voted against Douglas for state attorney in 1835. They found themselves on opposite sides of multiple different political campaigns. Sometimes Lincoln, in fact, would even speak after Douglas when he was giving a prominent speech in one of his campaigns, foreshadowing things that would come later on. And Lincoln said of Douglas, quote, of all the men he has seen, he has the most audacity in maintaining an untenable position. Well, the Kansas-Nebraska Act so deeply ups upsets Lincoln that it essentially revives his political career and it places him on the national stage once again. And in 1854, he gives a speech in Peoria, Illinois, known as the Peoria speech about the Kansas-Nebraska Act and this reopening of territories to the institution of slavery. And I have here a quote from it, which is very important. This declared indifference, but as I must think, covert real zeal for the spread of slavery, I cannot but hate. I hate it because of the monstrous injustice of slavery itself. I hate it because it deprives a Republican example of its just influence in the world enables the enemies of free institutions with plausibility to taunt us as hypocrites, causes the real friends of freedom to doubt our sincerity, and especially because it forces so many really good men amongst ourselves into an open war with the very fundamental principles of civil liberty. Criticizing the Declaration of Independence and insisting that there is no right principle of action but self-interest. I find it interesting when I hear arguments that Lincoln never cared about slavery one way or the other. When reading his speeches makes clear that he feels very strongly and passionately on this issue. Lincoln is saying that by opening up these territories to slavery, we're saying it doesn't matter if it spreads or not, which is counter to the founding father's wishes. That would become a central argument of his later. Another major event leading up to these debates, the Dred Scott case, handed down in 1857. Dred Scott here, a slave had been brought into free territories, free states, sued for his status as a free man. The Supreme Court of the United States, led by Chief, Chief Justice Roger Taney, said that Dred Scott, as a black man, had no standing to sue for his rights. He was not a citizen of the United States. And saying that Congress had no authority to pass any laws restricting the spread of slavery into Western territories essentially declaring the Missouri Compromise of 1820 unconstitutional. This decision helped to add more gasoline to the burning fire of sectional tension over slavery in the late 1850s. There's a lot of background story here that we have to cover for the debates themselves to make sense, but essentially the debates that occur at a highly volatile time, a result of all these different events. Added into the mix as well is the Lecompton Constitution. This occurs around the same time as Dred Scott, essentially after Kansas, Nebraska had opened up these territories to the westward spread of slavery. Kansas becomes a battleground in this fight, literally a battleground with pro and anti-slavery forces hoping to establish a foothold and establish Kansas as a free or slave state. Well, this constitution was one of four different drafts that were eventually submitted, and it was a constitution submitted by the pro-slavery forces. It was fraudulently claiming that Kansas would be a slave state which was counter to the wishes of the people of Kansas who when it came to a popular vote overwhelmingly voted down this constitution. Well this pro-slavery constitution was supported by President Buchanan and it was supported by Southern Democrats. It was opposed by Senator Douglas and opposed by Northern Democrats. So now the splits get even worse. This would have a major bearing on Douglas's own standing in his party as it came to 1858 and this crucial Senate race for Douglas to be reelected to his Senate seat in the state of Illinois. Now he's going to encounter some resistance from his own Democratic Party. <clears throat> the background to this race in 1858 Illinois, pictured here in this railroad map from the same year. In 1854, Lincoln had made a serious run at the Senate. For a cerebral man like Lincoln, he thought a Senate seat would be the perfect place for him. He said, I would rather have a full term in the Senate than any other office. He also wrote in 1854, I have really got it into my head to try to be a United States Senator. Well, of course, Lincoln didn't end up getting the nod from Republicans for, the, for this Senate seat in 1854, but he would try again. 
And when he's emerging as a figure, a leading candidate for the seat in 1858, he's dealing with a lot of different problems, one of which is that the Republican Party is only a few years old. It hasn't had a whole lot of time to establish a state system yet. It doesn't have a whole lot of office holders throughout the state. So it's working on things like patronage, things that help sway and influence political campaigns. It's also a very fractioned party. All these different elements are coming together, only kind of held together by this idea that they don't want the westward spread of slavery. So Lincoln has to find a way to speak to all sorts of different groups with different interests and attitudes if he wants to represent the Republicans in 1858. And of course, Douglas is a candidate leading into the election. He is a giant figure in the Senate, though small in stature, of course. Uh, but Douglas is a leading candidate, but as I noted, there are fractions within the Democratic Party that are going to make it difficult for him to run as well. And in Illinois politics in 1858, they have to focus on different sections of the state. Up top here, the northern sections, these are districts in the Senate or in the Illinois House which lean Republican. These are going to be Lincoln's stronghold if he ends up campaigning for the Senate. Down here, the white districts, they are Democratic strongholds. Really, the key to this Senate race in 1858 is going to be the central part of the state. And several of the debates between Lincoln and Douglas take place here in these areas that are composed of a mixture of political influences, but mostly they are members of the old Whig party. A lot of folks who think that Henry Clay was just the absolute best. These are going to be the people who ultimately decide the 1858 election. But there's one other very important thing we need to know before we dive into the Lincoln-Douglas debates and the campaign itself. And that is the state of race in Illinois in 1858. This is not a slave-holding state, yet it is one of the most unfriendly states for African Americans in the United States. Illinois had a small African American population, just over 5,000 according to the 1850 census. But through the years, there had been various laws passed severely restricting the rights of blacks in Illinois. And let's not forget, in 1837, there was an, a mob that attacked the newspaper press of abolitionist Elijah Lovejoy, and he was eventually killed in this melee that happened. And uh, this happens in one of the towns in Alton, Illinois, where the seventh and final one of these debates occurs. In 1853, legislation was passed making it a crime to bring a free black man to the state of Illinois, where you would be subject to a fine and possibly imprisonment. Frederick Douglass said this of the people of Illinois in 1858. What kind of people are the people of Illinois? Were they born and nursed of women, as other people are? Or are they the offspring of wolves and tigers, and only taught to prey upon all flesh pleasing to their bloody taste? If they are members of the human family, by what spirit are they animated? Is it from heaven or is it from hell? This is a very hostile racial environment that these debates will be taking place in, talking about things like race, citizenship, and freedom in the United States. And you absolutely cannot understand the statements of either one of these candidates throughout the campaign without understanding that very important fact first. The Chicago Times, a Democratic paper, wrote in 1858 that Illinois was, quote, known all over the Union as a state where white people are absolute and supreme. That is the Chicago Times. Lincoln was, quote, an advocate of Negro equality and Negro citizenship. A vote for Republicans would mean Illinois would become, quote, the Negro state. This is the backdrop for the 1858 campaign. Now, because Douglas had been at odds with the Buchanan administration, there were some Republicans who thought, hey, this is a guy who opposes the sitting Democratic president. What if we could get him to flip parties and represent us in the Senate? This is an obstacle that Lincoln has to encounter as a means to ensure against this step, Lincoln and his allies have the state Republican convention in June of 1858 take the unusual step of actually formally nominating him as their choice to run for the Senate seat that year. Typically, these conventions were just to coalesce the party doctrine. But Lincoln is proclaimed the actual Senate candidate in June of 1858. And at this convention, he gives one of the most famous speeches of his entire career, a speech that would be used against him quite a bit in the political campaign that fall. I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with this speech that Lincoln lays out. 
a central message up front in the speech, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. It will become all one thing or another. Either the opponents of slavery will arrest the further spread of it and place it where the public mind shall rest in the belief that it is in the course of ultimate extinction, or its advocates will push it forward till it shall become alike lawful in all the states, old as well as new, north as well as south. Have we no tendency to the latter condition? So what's Lincoln actually saying here? Lincoln is saying that thanks to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, opening up territories to the expansion of slavery based on popular sovereignty, whether the people in those territories wanted it. Based on the Dred Scott decision, which said that Congress could not prevent the westward spread of slavery into territories. A decision endorsed by the Buchanan administration that there was a democratic conspiracy to nationalize slavery, even into free states. Lincoln would argue all it takes is one more Supreme Court decision saying that there's no way Congress can say slavery can't exist in states, in free states, to make all of the states in the Union officially slave states. And he says right at the center of this national conspiracy is none other than sitting United States Senator, the man behind the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and his political opponent, Stephen Douglas. This speech, the House Divided speech, is the opening salvo of this Senate campaign. It is one of Lincoln's most eloquent, and it introduces a central theme that this nation cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. Is that Lincoln predicting civil war? Well, I don't know if he's predicting it, but he is saying that one way or the other, this issue is going to be settled going forward. It's rather a dramatic start to the campaign. Stephen Douglas himself kicks off his campaign on July 9th, 1858 in Chicago, Illinois, where he arrived to a 150-gun salute. And that evening, he hadn't really planned on giving formal remarks, but he stepped out onto a balcony at the Tremont Hotel, and he delivered a speech. If there is any principle dearer and more sacred than all others in free government, it is that which asserts the right of every people to form and adopt their own fundamental laws and to manage and regulate their own internal affairs and domestic institutions. Throughout this campaign, Douglas painted himself as the one who is defending the pure idea of democracy. Democracy as a basic mechanical process, 51% majority rule, they get to decide their laws. That is how it works. Douglas argued that his vision of democracy was the true vision of American democracy. He blasted Lincoln's speeches, stirring up strife, trying to foment insurrection. And he blasted Lincoln for claiming that blacks were equal to whites, saying, I am free to say to you that in my opinion, this government of ours is founded on the white basis. It was made by the white man for the benefit of the white man to be administered by white men in such manner as they should determine it. That's pretty much a foundational principle of Douglas's 1858 Senate campaign. This is a government for white men, by white men. African Americans were never intended to be included in this idea of American democracy, according to Stephen Douglas. The same position that Roger Taney laid out in the Dred Scott decision. Well, in the crowd that night, there was this tall lawyer, Abraham Lincoln, listening to Douglas's remarks. So Lincoln decided, I'm going to speak tomorrow night on that same hotel balcony. And this starts a pattern where, for several weeks, Lincoln is literally just following Douglas around the state, speaking right after him. Be like if uh, John Hoptak decided to do a lecture right after mine here. <laughs> It'd be far superior to mine, I'm sure. <laughs> but the next night, Lincoln got up on the same balcony. He had a few thousand fewer in the crowd that night. Douglas had about maybe 20,000. Lincoln had 9,000 in attendance. And he attacked Douglas's speech. He attacked what Douglas had to say. And it was a pretty bold speech given the current climate of Illinois in 1858. He defended his own house divided speech and he argued that slavery was morally wrong and that blacks and whites were equal in natural law. 
I have always hated slavery, I think as much as any abolitionist. I have been an old line Whig, I have always hated it, but have always been quiet about it until this new era of the, the introduction of the Nebraska bill. He said towards the end of the speech, my friends, let us discard all this quibbling about this man and the other man, this race and that race and the other race being inferior, and, th <clears throat> and therefore they must be placed in an inferior position discarding our standard that we have left us. Let us discard all these things and unite as one people throughout this land until we shall once more stand up declaring that all men are created equal. Pretty bold speech for 1858 Illinois. And again, this is developing a pattern where Lincoln for several weeks is following Douglas around the state. The discussions are centering entirely around slavery and popular sovereignty. The idea of who is a citizen and what is freedom in this country. Now the state Republicans in Illinois saw this and they thought, well, we would like to have a little bit closer rein in over what Lincoln is saying in response to Douglas, and we don't want it to look like he's this little puppy dog following Douglas around the state. So let's go ahead and reach out to Douglas directly and see if we can negotiate some sort of a shared campaign schedule where they're gonna make official joint appearances on the same stage together. Lincoln reaches out to Douglas asking him if he would be interested in these joint appearances. And Douglas, he's not really thrilled about this idea. Stephen Douglas is a national figure. Lincoln is a state figure. If they're on the same stage together, who stands to benefit the most from that? Abraham Lincoln, right? But if Douglas dodges this, how's that gonna look? This giant in the Senate is scared to debate this Senate candidate in Illinois? No, no, no. So Douglas agrees to do seven debates. The two candidates had already spoken in two of the nine areas, the two of the nine congressional districts. So these are gonna cover the other seven. And I'm gonna use this map for a lot of the program here showing where these debates are scattered throughout the state of Illinois. And the format was not one guy speaks for two minutes and then there's a green light or a red light. Then the other guy speaks for two minutes and there's a red light. And then Jim Lair asks another question. That's not how this works. These are actual debates. They're actually covering issues and ideas, not 20 second sound bites. The leading candidate, Douglas is the sitting senator, so he gets to lead off in four of the seven. The leading candidate will do a 60 minute introduction. Then there's a 90 minute response, followed by a 30 minute rebuttal. Thankfully, we don't have our lectures structured that way. <laughs> You're not gonna be here for three hours, I don't think. <laughs> but that's the format that is agreed to for these debates. 60 minute introduction, 90 minute response, 30 minute rebuttal. And you can see here, they're scattered all across the state geographically. And remember that map that we saw, the northern part of the state, heavy Republican, southern part of the state, heavy Democrat, middle part, ah, those are the counties that really matter the most. And these debates are going to be printed in newspapers. As I noted earlier, they're reporters transcribing them with shorthand notations. So within 24 hours, they're being printed by papers in Chicago. Within 36 hours, people all across the country are reading the words of these debates. So these candidates are going to use these debates as a means for spreading their message far and wide. And that is going to be huge, especially for the career of Abraham Lincoln. Now the two candidates together on stage would kind of create an odd sight. Notice how I arranged the pictures here. <laughs> two distinctly different speaking styles, two distinctly uh, different statures. One onlooker said, I have never seen any, two, any other two public men appearing on the same platform so unlike. Lincoln was tall, lanky, and awkward. Douglas is short and stout and full of passion. He spoke with a uh, much quicker rate of speed, about 125 words a minute, as opposed to Lincoln's 100 words a minute. He had a voice like the roar of a lion, according to Carl Schurz. And in the lead up to the first debate, these candidates are campaigning, and they are campaigning in between the debates themselves as well. They're honing their message. And for Douglas, a big part of that is race-based attacks against Lincoln, saying that this is a man who, if he has his way, African Americans are gonna be citizens, they're gonna be candidates for public office in Illinois. He is a black Republican candidate. Some of the 
slogans used by the Democrats were, beware the advocates of Negro equality and fight and overthrow the black Republican Party. Another thing to note for Lincoln, on top of taking on one of the most famous senators in the country, he still has to deal with his legal practice. So he's juggling a lot. The first debate, August 21st of 1858 in Ottawa, Illinois. 10 to 12,000 people were present, and the debate started at 2.30 in the afternoon. Keep in mind, Douglas is the main draw here. He's much more notable than Lincoln, much more famous. <coughs> so he's the guy bringing out a lot of these big crowds, especially early on. A lot of reporters are there taking this event in. This is a political spectacle. It's public entertainment. It's civic entertainment. And the debates are on. We're going to find here that a lot of the debates are going to center on similar things. So I'm going to be repeating a lot of these themes that are focused on for each of the debates as we go forward here. But it's important that we get a sense of how these all played out. Douglas leads off charging Lincoln with wanting Illinois to become, quote, a Negro colony, saying, I do not regard the Negro as my equal. Douglas leans very heavily on these racial attacks against Lincoln, trying to stir up racial feel, fear excuse me, in the state of Illinois. He's using white supremacist attacks, using phrases such as what we heard earlier, I believe this government was made by white men for the benefit of white men and their posterity forever. And, am I, and I am in favor of confining citizenship to white men, men of European birth and descent, instead of conferring it upon Negroes, Indians, and other inferior races. Douglas asked Lincoln a series of questions here, hoping to force him into a corner on these issues, such as would he advocate the repeal of the fugitive slave law? Did he, inter did he oppose the interstate slave trade? Would he ban slavery in territories below the Missouri Compromise Line? And would he ban further territory acquisitions unless slavery was prevented in them? Now, when Lincoln rises, he oddly kind of dismisses Douglas's questions. Now, in all likelihood, that's because Lincoln was not a very good off-the-cuff speaker. He had his notes, he had his prepared remarks, and he tried to stick to them. He would eventually address Douglas's questions, but he doesn't do that right away in the first debate at Ottawa. He goes on the defense saying, I have no purpose to introduce political and social equality between the white and the black races. But he also notes that while he is not campaigning to introduce equality during the, between the races, remember, 1858 Illinois, his campaign's dead if he says anything otherwise. There is no reason in the world why the Negro is not entitled to all the natural rights enumerated in the Declaration of Independence, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Saying that we can debate, or the, the equality of, of blacks in the political sphere is one matter. Lincoln was sticking to his argument According to natural law in the Declaration, African Americans were citizens of this country and they deserved to be treated with basic equality. He attacked Douglas's idea of popular sovereignty as nothing less than the perpetuity and the nationalization of the institution of slavery. And this first debate was extremely, extremely negative. Both candidates were basically unloading all their best attack lines on the others that they had been honing throughout the campaign thus far. Very, very negative debate. But already, Lincoln is starting to garner attention from these debates. The Chicago Tribune wrote, Who is this new man? You have a David greater than the Democratic Goliath or any other I ever saw. The second debate, the northern part of Illinois, Freeport. Lincoln leads off this debate, and he has a chance to address Douglas's seven different questions, answering them, trying to fend off these attacks from his Democratic opponent. It's worth noting here that Freeport, again, think about where the Republicans are in Illinois, the northern part of the state. Do we think Douglas probably got a friendly reception in Freeport? No, one person in the crowd threw part of a melon at Douglas. That's why we didn't let people bring melons in today to throw them at me here. <clears throat> but yeah, not a, not a very friendly reception for Douglas there at all. A very hostile reception. He was jeered by the crowd. And uh, he's having to fight his way through this, projecting his voice and making his arguments there. Now, Lincoln poses his own questions to Douglas in Freeport. One of those questions is asking Douglas, could popular sovereignty 
be used to prevent slavery from its expansion into territories and states. Now hold on a second here. How does that make sense? If Lincoln is saying that popular sovereignty is nothing less than spreading slavery west, why would he give Douglas a chance to say that's not true? Lincoln, in this question, known as the Freeport question, is setting a political catch-22 trap for Stephen Douglas. If Douglas says, no, slavery could not be excluded in the territories, his campaign in 1858 is in deep trouble. If he says, yes, popular sovereignty could lead to slavery being excluded in these territories, how is that going to play with Southern Democrats who Douglas needs two years later in 1860? Lincoln had a brilliant legal mind. It was said that in a court case, if there were seven crucial points, Lincoln could concede six of them, knowing that without the seventh point, the first six didn't really matter all that much. He had a brilliant strategic mind for analyzing problems and thinking tactically on how to solve them. This free point question is part of that. Lincoln said that he was, quote, killing larger game. The Battle of 1860 is worth a hundred of this. He was hoping to alienate Southern Democrats from Stephen Douglas, which, as we'll see later, is exactly what happened. But this debate, overall, Lincoln is doing quite well early on in these debates, establishing himself as a viable opponent for Douglas. The third debate, taking place in the deep southern part of the state, heavy Democrat area, a very pro-slavery part of Illinois. Douglas led off claiming that Lincoln was radicalizing politics, radicalizing the old Whig party, making it an abolition party, trying to push through his own ideas, stirring up strife, calling up insurrection with this house divided speech. And yet again here we see this quote, I hold that this government was made on the white basis by white men for the benefit of white men and their posterity forever. Lincoln's arguments evolved as the debates progressed. Douglas kept hammering the same point over and over and over again. He uses this language in almost every single debate about the founding of the American government. Lincoln responds by saying that the founding fathers did not intend slavery to flourish but for it to be restricted not expanding westward. And he presses Douglas on whether or not he would support federal laws protecting slavery in the territories. Douglas pivots and defends popular sovereignty once again. Again, the issues are pretty similar in these debates as they go back and forth. The fourth debate, Charleston, Illinois, in the eastern part of the state. Lincoln leads off. And he leads off with some language addressing these racial attacks that Douglas has been launching towards him. This is what Lincoln says early on in the debate. I will say then that I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever have been, in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office nor to intermarry with white people, and I will say in addition to this that there is a physical difference between the white and black races, which I believe will forever forbid the two races living together on terms of social and political equality. Those are words that Lincoln historians have grappled with for generations. Those are very difficult words to hear from our 16th president on issues of racial equality. Very difficult words to square. Couple key things to keep in mind. Lincoln is a product of his time. He holds similar racial attitudes to others in his time. He does not hold racial attitudes of our day today. It's also important to keep in mind that had he not addressed these attacks against him by Douglas, his campaign would have been in major trouble. Remember everything we talked about, about that context of Illinois in 1858. Not necessarily making an excuse for Lincoln saying these things, but helping to explain why he was saying them and explain his own attitudes on this issue. Though his comments make us cringe, we have to remember the context of this, and that especially here in Charleston, he's speaking in a heavy former Whig area, one which, though supportive of pre preventing slavery's spread, was not very friendly 
to African Americans. This is a state, keep in mind, where laws had been passed preventing African Americans from immigrating there. Lincoln reiterated that his official purpose was to oppose the Kansas-Nebraska Act and oppose slavery because it was morally wrong. And I think when we consider that together with Lincoln's comments on race, we can see that while he is still subject to the racial attitudes of his time, he is speaking out and saying that slavery is morally wrong and it should be opposed and put on the course of ultimate extinction. Douglas says he's glad he finally got Lincoln to make some comments on racial issues, though Lincoln didn't go far enough in denouncing African Americans in Illinois. And the back and forth in Charleston centers prompt predominantly on these racial issues, on these questions. Lincoln reiterating that slavery was wrong and should be restricted, while Douglas believes that it's simply part of ordinary life. And this is a new wrinkle to Lincoln's argument, something that which would occur more increasingly as the debates go on. Slavery was wrong. Lincoln believed slavery was wrong. Douglas thought it was just another political issue, not a matter of morality. The fifth debate in Galesburg, Illinois, October 7th, 1858, takes place at Knox College. Over 15,000 people in attendance. Douglas defends his positions on the Lecompton Constitution, on popular sovereignty, attacks Lincoln once again for radicalizing the Republicans. And he says, this Chicago doctrine of Lincoln's declaring that the Negro and the white man are made equal by the Declaration of Independence and by divine providence is a monstrous heresy. That's another thing to keep in mind. Lincoln's opponent, Douglas, said that the thought that blacks and whites were equal at all was a monstrous heresy. He also noted that Lincoln was changing his message in certain parts of the state. Now, there was some truth to that. Lincoln was tailoring his arguments to different parts of the state, thinking on where they would play best. And in that regard, you better believe Abraham Lincoln is a politician. Lincoln responds by saying that Douglas needed to prove that the founders of the country did not mean that all men were created equal. He cites Jefferson's belief in the injustice of the institution of slavery. He calls slavery a moral, social, and political evil saying that he desired a policy that looks to the prevention of it as a wrong and looks hopefully to the time when, as a wrong, it may come to an end. And he also says that no one, quote, logically can say that anybody has a right to do wrong. And here we see the debate centering on their central idea. What is democracy? Is democracy simply whatever the majority says? Or is there a moral element to it? Is there a foundational element to it protecting moral, natural law? Lincoln has his best debate yet in Galesburg, and Douglas is starting to go downhill. Douglas's health was starting to fail. He was frequently intoxicated. He was a heavy drinker, and that was having an effect on Douglas as well. And nationally, Republicans and Democrats are really taking attention and focus on this campaign, noting that this is going to have a major impact on the coming uh, presidential election in 1860. The sixth debate in Quincy, Illinois. Another former uh, Whig audience. The rest of the campaign is going to be playing out mostly across this middle middle part of the state here. Lincoln opens up the debate denies making different speeches in different parts of the states and argues once again that slavery was a threat to the Union because of its immorality. And it's a very smart argument to make here because there's a lot of fans of Henry Clay here. A lot of Whigs thought that the biggest political goal was simply keeping this country together. Well, now Lincoln is saying, Douglas's popular sovereignty, it was, we were told it was going to help keep the country together. If anything, it's tearing the country further apart. Look at Dred Scott. Look at the bloodshed in Kansas. Look at all of this strife. In fact, popular sovereignty is not doing what we were told. Both are essentially arguing on who is the greater threat to the Union. They're trying to take the mantle of Henry Clay, saying that they are the rightful heir, appealing to this former Whig audience. Lincoln once again arguing that Douglas was nationalizing the institution of slavery. And for Lincoln, all of this is building up to the seventh and final debate in Alton, Illinois, on October 15th, 
1858. Only a few thousand were in attendance there. This is the town where Lovejoy had been killed by a mob. The abolitionist Lovejoy had been killed in 1837. Douglas leads off his declining health evident to everyone in attendance, claiming that once again he was fighting for the proper American spirit of equality, reiterating his arguments from throughout the campaign, blasting Lincoln with attacks saying he was an abolitionist seeking equality between the races. Lincoln's response claimed that he was the rightful heir of Henry Clay, criticizing the Dred Scott decision, saying that the Founding Fathers intended for slavery to be restricted. And he centers on his most powerful argument of the entire debates. Slavery was wrong, and quote, Douglas, he cannot say people have a right to do wrong. Slavery was fundamentally wrong and as such, a threat to the very basis of democracy. That is the real issue. That is the issue which will continue in this country when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. It is the eternal struggle between these two principles, right and wrong, throughout the world. They are the two principles that have stood face to face from the beginning of time and will ever continue to struggle. The one is the common right of humanity, and the other, the divine right of kings. It is the same principle in whatever shape it develops itself. It is the same spirit that says, you work and toil and earn bread, and I will eat it. No matter in what shape it comes, whether from the mouth of a king who seeks to bestride the people of his own nation and live by the fruit of their labor, or from one race of men as an apology for enslaving another, it is the same tyrannical principle. Lincoln's argument that slavery was morally wrong was an argument about the basis for democracy. If we're not all equal, how does democracy work? If there are superior and inferior classes in society, that is the divine right of kings, ladies and gentlemen. Slavery declares that there is an entire race of people that is inferior. You can't have a democracy unless there is equality. Accepting slavery was to accept dehumanization and a hierarchy of inferiority and superiority. Douglas's rebuttal to Lincoln simply rehashed his arguments from throughout the campaign, and the debates came to a close. For a few more weeks, the campaign continued as both candidates struggled to get out their message. Election day came November 2nd of 1858. And another very important thing to keep in mind here, this is before the 17th Amendment. Lincoln and Douglas aren't actually candidates on the ballot. When people vote in this election in November of 1858, they're not voting for Lincoln or Douglas, they're voting for state party candidates. Candidates for the state Senate, candidates for the state house, because it is the state legislature which elects the senators. Another major obstacle which Lincoln faced, in 1855, Illinois Democrats had redrawn districts to favor them. So it would make it very, very difficult for any member of this new Republican Party to get elected to the Senate. It took several days to be sure, but Lincoln knew by that evening that Democrats had taken the Illinois legislature based on how races were being called in the Whig belt in the center part of the state. Republicans won 35 seats in the House, Democrats won 40. Republicans won 11 in the Senate, Democrats won 14. Democrats had the legislature 54 to 46. And when the, legislator vote, the legislature voted on the Senate, Stephen Douglas won by a vote of 54 to 46. So Douglas won, right? Well, he did, but what about the popular vote? The way the popular vote played out, Republicans received more votes than Democrats did in this election. For House races, Republicans received 190,468 votes. Democrats received 166,374. With Buchanan Democrats, a fractured part of the party, getting just under 10,000. 
In the Senate, just under 100,000 votes were cast. Republicans had just shy of 54,000. Democrats had just shy of 45,000. So Republicans won the popular vote in Illinois House races all added up together, and in Illinois Senate races altogether. And being that Lincoln was the most notable Republican, we might make the argument that Lincoln had in effect won this popular vote against Stephen Douglas. But nonetheless, despite winning the popular vote, he did not win the election. This is something that of course has played out time to time on the national stage with presidential elections, with the Electoral College. That's essentially what we're seeing here in the state of Illinois. So Douglas was victorious, or was he? Stephen Douglas soon learned that the debates had been a debilitating blow to his political career and his political standing. Lincoln had done significant damage to him. Soon after the debates, Douglas journeyed south on his way towards a vacation, and he found hostility from slaveholders. When he returned to Congress, he was removed from his chairmanship on the Committee on Territories. Prominent Southerners like Edmund Ruffin, Jefferson Davis, Judah Benjamin were all vocally critical of Douglas, saying that in these debates against Lincoln, he had admitted flaws with popular sovereignty. He had admitted that he was not the friend that slaveholding Democrats thought he was. Edmund Ruffin called Douglas, quote, a great political scoundrel. And this Freeport question was used as a weapon against Douglas. Remember, this is a question that Lincoln posed to him in the second debate, asking whether or not popular sovereignty could be used to prevent the spread of slavery. When Douglas said yes, Southern Democrats are learning, hey, this is something that might actually stop the spread of slavery. We didn't think about it in that regard. Maybe it's not such a great idea. Indeed, when Democrats met in Charleston, South Carolina in 1860, Stephen Douglas is the biggest national name vying for the nomination for the presidency, but he is not going to be the Democratic candidate, certainly not of the entire Democratic Party. One journalist noted that the Mississippians have the Freeport speech of Douglas with them on the convention floor, and they intend to bombard him in the convention with ammunition drawn from it. Lincoln's attacks on Douglas had worked. There was a second nominating convention in Baltimore which gave Douglas the nomination of Northern Democrats. Vice President John Breckinridge got the nomination of Southern Democrats and John C. Bell led a constitutional union party hoping to find old Whig support and the idea of the union in the face of this increasingly perilous crisis facing the country. And oh yeah, there's one more candidate in 1860. How did Lincoln respond to his defeat? Defeat leading to ultimate success. Though it was not easy, he maintained his resolve, writing to fellow Republicans, the fight must go on, and, quote, the cause of civil liberty must not be surrendered at the end of one or even 100 defeats. When Douglas was v uh, voted in in January, Lincoln told a fellow attorney, quote, it hurts too much to laugh and I am too big to cry. But the debates had made him a national figure. They caught the attention of people all across the United States. They were published, sold by the thousands, and these lead to Lincoln emerging on the national stage. In 1859, he and Douglas were campaigning again in Ohio on opposite sides of a political campaign. In early 1860, Lincoln was invited to New York to deliver a speech at Cooper Union where he said, arguing against the westward spread of slavery, let us have faith that right makes might. And in that faith, let us to the end dare to do our duty as we understand it. In that saying, we have Lincoln's fundamental understanding of democracy. It's not might that makes right. It's not the will of 51% that says they can do whatever they want. It's right that gives the power, right that makes might. That fall, Abraham Lincoln was elected the 16th president of the United States. His reputation, unknown previously outside of Illinois and Indiana, had exploded as a result of these debates leading him to the highest office in the land. 
Lincoln himself noted that he was, quote, accidentally elected president of the United States because of, quote, his having made a race for the Senate of the United States with Judge Douglas in the state of Illinois. For Stephen Douglas himself, he would die in June of 1861, his health declining rapidly. For Lincoln, the man who debated Douglas across the state of Illinois, saying that he was not an abolitionist, that he simply sought to stop the westward spread of slavery, ends up becoming known as the Great Emancipator. Once he is president, once in the midst of this war, he sees an opportunity to strike down slavery, he issues his Emancipation Proclamation. Certainly a progression, an evolution from his position in the campaign in Illinois, but it's just a few years afterwards that Lincoln signs the single most important presidential action in American history. Of course, Lincoln himself only had a few more years to live. In that seventh debate, he made mention, when these poor tongues of Judge Douglas and myself shall be silent. Pictured here is Douglas's tomb in Chicago and Lincoln's tomb in Springfield. What is the lasting significance of these debates? They were a turning point for Lincoln, making him a national figure. They were a turning point for the country, focusing in this debate on slavery. Now, the memory of them sometimes suggests that these debates were the ancestor of our modern presidential debates. That's not really true. Um, if you've watched one of the modern presidential debates, they really have nothing in common with the Lincoln-Douglas debates. As I noted earlier, it's these 30-second sound bites going back and forth. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were some serious material, such as what we covered here today. But these debates were so important because of their impact on the candidates, becoming a millstone around Douglas's neck and boosting Lincoln to the presidency, but they were also a turning point for the nation, helping to narrow in this focus on what is democracy, what is the importance of this. The eternal struggle between these two principles, what is right, what is wrong, what is the basis of American democracy? And as we said at the outset, it's just five years that separates the 1858 Senate candidate Lincoln from the Lincoln who's here at Gettysburg. And he's talking about the same thing. Lincoln said on his way to Washington, D.C. in February of 1861, he stopped in Philadelphia and he said he has never had a political sentiment that was not based in the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration of Independence, Lincoln said, recalling Proverbs, was an apple of gold enshrined in a frame of silver, which was the Constitution. When Lincoln's here at Gettysburg, what's the basis of his argument? What's the basis of his speech? Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. That's the starting point. That's the foundation of democracy, as he had argued five years before in Illinois. 38 years after the debate in Galesburg, Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, journeyed back to Knox College, and he spoke of what this speech that his father gave, these debates that his, fathers had, his father had taken part in, what they meant for the country. The issues of 1858 have long been settled. My father called the struggle one between right and wrong. In, spirit of, in spite of the great odds against him, he battled on, sustained by conscience and supported by the idea that when the fogs cleared away, the people would be found on the side of right. He was right, and today not a man could be found who would not resist the evil against which he protested. This should give us confidence in our own battles against evils of our own times. Now, as then, there can be but one supreme issue, that between right and wrong. In our country, there are no ruling classes. The right to, <clears throat> the right to direct public affairs according to his might and influence and conscience belongs to the humblest, as well as to the greatest. The elections represent the judgments of individual voters. Perhaps at times, one vote can destroy or make the country's prosperity for 30 years. The power of the people, by their judgments, expressed through the ballot box to shape their own destinies, sometimes makes one tremble. But it is in times of danger, critical moments, which bring into action 
the high moral quality of citizenship in America. The people are always true. They are always right, and I have an, abate, an abiding faith that they will remain so. What Robert Todd Lincoln said, that's the argument his father made in 1858 in Illinois. It's the argument his father made here at Gettysburg five years later in 1863. And without those debates, I don't think Lincoln ever finds his way here to Gettysburg. I want to thank you folks for joining us here this afternoon. Uh, thank you for taking part in our lecture series. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. <clears throat>